we'll be looking at the rational root theorem. And this video is divided into two parts. A, we'll just look at how it works and what we can do with it. And B, we'll see why it works. So we start out, we have this lovely uh, cubic equation and we want to find the roots. When does this equal zero? Now, if this was a quadratic equation, we'd use a quadratic formula, or completing the square, whatever. Okay, but we have a cubic. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this two and we're gonna take this three and we're gonna write them like this. And now I'm gonna list all the factors of two, which is pretty nice of plus or minus one, plus or minus two. And I'm gonna list all the factors of three, plus or minus one, plus or minus three. I mean, these are prime, so they've only got two factors, that makes this easy. Now, if there is a rational root, that's if, as my dad used to say, if is a little word with a big meaning. It will have a form such as this, you know, P over Q, such that P is one of these factors and Q is, P is one of the factors on top. So for example, one uh, plus or minus one. Um, and Q is one of these factors on the bottom, for example, plus or minus one. So we have these to choose from. Uh, the next one, next possibility, plus or minus two over plus or minus one, or uh, plus or minus one over plus or minus three, and plus or minus two over plus or minus three. So there's only four possibilities for a rational root if one exists. It may be that no real roots exist or that the roots are all irrational, but this gives us a place to start. Uh, so what we'll do here is we plug in all of these possibilities, plus or minus one, uh, plus or minus two, plus or minus one third, uh, plus or minus two thirds. And as we plug them all in, which we won't go through all the arithmetic here, we will find that plus one third wins the prize. So we do have a rational root. So we've tried out all the possibilities and it turns out that one third is a root of this cubic equation. So we can set off one of the factors as x minus one third. And we know now that we'll multiply that by some quadratic to give us zero. Now we need to figure what that out is. And we can use synthetic division or long division. I'll use long division here. So we now have our quadratic, which is 3x squared minus 6. I've taken out the 3 from the quadratic, and now we have uh, x squared minus 2. We could treat that as a difference of squares. So in this case, uh, we've got three real roots, uh, plus 1 third, and then plus or minus uh, square root of two. So it so happens because I set it up this way that there are three <laughs> that there are three real roots, but only one rational root. And now we'll take a look at why this works. Now that we know what to do, why does this even work? Let's take our generic polynomial. It's got x to the power of something as each term, either n or n minus 1 or n minus 2, la 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 la, all the way down to x squared, uh, x, and then finally there's no x or it's, it, 
x to the power of zero if we want to call it that. So this is an n degree polynomial. Each term has a constant or a leading coefficient which we've designated here as a and the n, the n minus 1, the 2, the 1 and 0, these all this is these all um, indicate the the term number. Okay, so I'm just using this so that uh, a sub a sub n times x to the power of n this tells us what term has this exponent. Okay? So we've rewritten the entire equation but now we've got the constant term on the right hand side of the equation so it's had to change its sign it's now negative. Now we are saying what if there is a rational root which we'll call PQ. P over Q. Now remember a rational number uh, is a ratio between two integers. And we're also going to decide that p over q is in lowest terms. So for example, uh, if we have 6 eighths is our rational root, then p is going to be 3 and q is going to be 4. And we want to take note that what this means is that P and Q have no common factors. This may start to look strange because we're going, well, why are we saying there's a rational root? And why are we, because we don't know that there's a rational root, and how can we say what P and Q are? What we're doing is we're saying, what if, what if there were a rational root? What would it look like? how would that root fit into our polynomial? We've inserted our proposed root p over q into the equation in the place of x. If p over q is a root then this equation will be true and now we'll multiply everything left and right by q to the power of n. The exponent on the p portion of the rational expression will remain the same, but the q exponent will change. The coefficient and the p part of the polynomial will remain unchanged, but the exponent on the q will change entirely. The first term will have no q whatsoever. The next term will be q to the power of 1, so just q, and ascending this term has q to the power of n minus 2. This term q to the power of n minus 1, and this term just q to the power of n. Now we can factor out a p. The term on the right, it doesn't have a p. Uh, it doesn't change. We're only factoring out the p now from the left hand side of the equation. With the p factored out, the p portion of the term sees its exponent reduced by 1. Which means this final term doesn't have a p at all. The right hand side of the equation remains unchanged. We only factored out the p from the left hand side. Now the best part of all of this is we no longer really need to look closely at what's in here. So let's just call it uh, s. So this then simplifies to ps equals negative a naught times q to the n. Now remember that p and q are integers with no common factors. Therefore p cannot divide q. p doesn't go into q. But if this product p times s 
equals this, then any factors any factors that p has must belong to a naught. So we would write that as p divides a naught, and we don't need to care about the negative sign here. So here's what we know. ps equals negative a naught q to the n. That implies that p divides a naught. That means that p is a factor of a naught. But remember that uh, p, where did we get p? That's the, that's the numerator. And a naught, that's the constant term. So the numerator divides the constant term. The numerator divides the constant term. So that's the first part of our proof. Now, what about the second part? As before, we'll begin with our paradigm polynomial, uh, but this time we're going to move this term way over to the right. And as before, we insert the rational root. We replace x with p over q. Now we have the constant term stays on the left-hand side, and it's what was formerly the first term has taken on a negative sign, gone to the right-hand side of the equation, and we've inserted p over q where it belongs. Now, as before, multiply everything by q to the power of n. And now, as before, the p term has descending powers, starting with n minus 1, and then going down to 2, 1, and finally disappearing here on the left-hand side. Then the q part of the term starts with just q, and then it goes up. So the last few terms are n minus 2, n minus 1, and n. Now, on the right-hand side, the p term, the p part of the term remains p to the power of n, and the q part disappears entirely. This time, the common factor we'll take out will be q. And as before, we'll end up with q times a bunch of stuff, which we'll call t, equals negative a sub n times p to the power of n. And then, as before, q and p are integers with no common factors, which means that q must divide a sub n. So q divides the initial coefficient, and p divides the constant term. And that will be true if p divided by q which is a rational expression, is a root. Bob's your uncle.